folks, thanks for um, coming. So my name is Ronald um, De La Cruz, so I'm the lead developer for Real Serious Games. And um, but for this session, I'm just going to be showing you how to create a VR game from scratch using both Blueprints and C++. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be setting up a base VR project, create a VR pawn um, from scratch with motion controller input. We're going to do some movement mechanics, um, two types, um, six. If you ever it will be that, and as well as thumbstick or thumb, um, thumb pad driven, which everyone seems to like. And CPU, we're also going to be going to um, CPU performance profiling and a little bit of tips on when to use Blueprint or C++. So during the creation of the game that we're going to be creating tonight, um, we're going to make some key decisions on whether to use C++ or Blueprint. But we'll start off with some basics with the Blueprints part. So how many of you guys here have actually had some, so that I will know how to kind of tailor the, uh, the session? How many of you have actually done Unreal? Oh, okay, everyone. So how many of you have done Blueprints? Okay, and C++? All right, so okay. So pretty, pretty much even. All right, so I probably could go a little bit faster then during the session, and 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 if, if you have any questions, just um just let me know. All right, so maybe we'll start off with just showing you quickly the simple game that we're going to be creating here. So I just cheekily called it um, surfboards and boomerangs. So it's supposed to be part of our series. So this is going to be the first one, which is um, just one surfboard, one boomerang. There's some um, stuff in your way and then you're supposed to go to the portal, you're controlling the surfboard as well as controlling that boomerang and then just destroying stuff along the way until you get to the boomerang to a different level. So once you get to the portal, you're supposed to be teleported to a different um, level. All right. So I guess as well, um, how many of you have actually done VR development? So two, three, all right. So there's be, gonna be some value in this, I guess, for, for a lot of you guys. Um, let me, uh, okay. Let me just take the screen off for a while because I forgot to, there's some stuff that I can't show on the screen. Um, sorry, let me just start off a project from scratch. Okay, oh, dang. can't do the launcher because I don't have internet here. It's like just gonna do. Sorry? Tether. What does that mean? This guy. Um, so, figure out where I place my stuff. 4.2 engine. Oh, you mean for the um, Wi-Fi. No, oh, that's fine. It's just that the I can't use the launcher <laughs> just to launch the engine. I just have to go do it manually. All right. All right, sorry. I'm just going to put back the screen now. All right, so we're just going to start with just going to start with a basic um, VR project. So we're going to do a blueprint. Oh, sorry. Start with a. Let's start off with blueprint and a blank blank project with no starter content, and let's just call this boards and boomerangs. Say. Eh? So 
so most of you have probably, if you've dabbled with a little bit with VR in Unreal, so you probably use a template. So what we're gonna be doing is actually creating something like the template but from scratch so that you have full control on the code itself and like how to set it up properly. All right, so one of the, um, the first things I'd like to do um, when I'm in the engine is to kind of just have a little bit of a structure in there. And this is pretty common in the Unreal community. So you just start off with your root folder as the name of the project itself. And I'm just gonna start map. If I had internet, I'm gonna show you this. I'm basically using the format from Alar on how to do the, the structure for the format folder. From what? Uh, Alar, A-L-L-A-R. Yeah. I'm probably not pronouncing his name right as well. All right, I'm just gonna save this map quickly. And this is going to be our end map. And I'm gonna create a new one. Let's start off with a completely empty level. Let's save that one. And I'm gonna use that as a start map. Now I can see that I've made a couple of mistakes there. I'm just gonna move the maps in there. And quickly fix up redirectors. So every time I've want to move stuff, you'd probably, you often want to do the fix up redirectors so that in your directory structure, you don't have some stray files in there called redirectors for Unreal. So, all right. And, and then let's start with the project settings. If it comes up. So I'm just gonna type VR here. So this is one of the new stuff forgot which engine version it started for 18, I think, where you can have the start in VR in there. Now there are a couple of settings that you can use, obviously like um, using forward renderer. I'm not gonna activate that now because it takes a while to recompile stuff. But yeah, so all of this art stuff, um, we're gonna just skip for now. I'm gonna focus completely on the development cycle. So um, I'm gonna treat this kind of like a slice of um, a development cycle in VR development from a studio but we're gonna be touching up a lot of different things and I'm gonna be pointing out stuff that we usually do in a studio and who does what, okay? All right, so we got start map and one of the things as well I like doing is, since now I have a start and end map, I just quickly do this so that whenever I restart things, it's gonna start where I feel it should start. All right, so pretty basic so far. So we've just set up a basic level, a blank, a blank level, so we have an end map, which is our goal, and the start map where we're actually gonna be playing the game. So now let's actually set up the VR things, right? So what I like doing is creating a VR folder here. And first thing I, you do is create a blueprint class called a game mode, which basically just tells, um, you, you can specify your own custom pawn or custom player uh, character that you can have. So I just like, sorry, we are game mode. Tell me if I'm going too fast. I'm going at this pace because a lot of you have already done um, Unreal. Then I'm gonna create a pawn which is a basic pawn. And this is where all the magic happened. So in Unreal, um, so the Epic engineers have been pretty good in making things uh, very VR friendly. So if I run this in VR now, it would actually just work with a camera. But what, we'd no what I'd like normally doing, and I think a lot of VR developers miss this, is this part. So I add a, let me just add a scene origin here. Uh, sorry. So I've seen a lot of projects that miss this. I'm just gonna start with that. So I have my own camera, and I think also because the templates from the engine 
also miss this for some reason. So that's gonna be the VR camera. So what this does is it overrides the default camera that comes with the pawn. So you have a bit more control over it. And one of the things that I like changing is the field of view, especially if I'm making a do something for the Vive or for the Rift. So if it's exclusively for Vive or the Rift, um, if you, if for some of you have done VR projects, if you just use a template, have a look at your game with the 90, the default, change it to 110 and see the difference of what you could see in the world. So it's quite a huge difference. And it might also decide some of your art, art stuff. Yeah, art, art. art, sorry. All right. All right, so let's go back to the slides a bit. Let's pretend that we have a game designer and we get um, a game designer coming to us with a GDD, with a game design document. So this is a very overly simplified part of it. So what the game designer wants is a full 360, um, uh, sorry, a room scale um, VR experience with six degrees of freedom and what he wants, he or she wants, is to be able to use the controller, point at the controller and fly around where you're pointing the controller by pressing the trigger here, all right? So that's one of the key things that um, they want. The goal of the game is to go from level A to level B by going through the portal like you've seen in the video. And just to make things interesting, there are gonna be some obstacles in there which is the floating rocks. And you're gonna be able to control a boomerang using your thumbstick here and just moving this thumbstick around, okay? So that's the, the th three things that we're gonna be looking at implementing on this game. All right, so, so far what we've done is just a VR pawn with a camera, and we're just now gonna add the motion controllers. So, what's nice with Unreal, and some of you might already know, let me just put in the motion controllers, is that um, I'm not 100% sure with Unity, but with Unreal, it's completely hardware agnostic. So if I put motion controller here, it will know, depending on the hardware that I have, in, I have on my machine, whether I'm using the Vive or the Rift or any other VR. So I just need to set up a motion controller component. So most people have two hands, so I'll put um, motion controller left and motion controller right. But a quick setup would be, so normally you'd work with an artist. As a developer, you'd probably want to start mocking things up with the, um, device model. So what, um, with this new, new later versions of the engine, you have this visualization already built in. That means it just shows you the mesh of the controller depending on which hardware that's plugged in. So if, I'm, if I've got my Vive plugged in now, this will just automate my Vive. So it's V-I-V-E, it's a type of uh, VR hardware. So it will just simply change to a Vive wand instead of the, um, the Oculus Rift controllers, which I have now. Okay, and you could immediately see that in there. And what I do is I just press Control W here. I probably am spamming the thing outside. Let me just delete that. Yep, and then press Motion Controller right. And just change the motion source to right here. Okay. So now we have a VR pawn which will represent the player in the world. And the game mode now, I'm just gonna set that up so that the default pawn class points to that new VR pawn that we just created here. And in the world, I'll probably want to add some directional light, right? So, just to have some light in there. And uh, player start, which will indicate where the player will be starting in the world. So I'm just gonna randomly throw those in. And that should be already playable, unless I miss something. with directional light hasn't started. 
Yep, so one of the things, um, since we're modifying the game mode, we have to obviously set up the VR game mode into the level. Just make sure we're on the same. So you can see now that we have this motion controller represented and it's in here. So the engine does that all for you. So there's nothing much to see here. So if you just want a bit of a frame of reference, like you can just put a cone in there and that will be, right. So you see where the blue thing is, is that's where the pawn is facing. Probably just want to face the pawn in there. You can see, all right. So right about this time, you've just set up a very basic um, VR project, and this is where the developers are already push it into either Perforce or get um, into the, your Git repository. And then your um, lead artist would start doing the materials. So one of the first things the um, lead artist will do is create a master material. So let me just do that now from here. It's going to create a new folder called Material Library. All right. And I'm going to start off with a basic material. Just to get some interest in here. Let's just call it Master for now. So a lot of you have doubled in Unreal before. You'd probably just um, start creating a shader from here, which is what we're going to be doing. Sorry, what we're going to be doing. Just going to plug stuff in there, and just going to do a multiply. It's pretty dark in this world, so we're just going to do that, and probably have a value coming off in there. And you get, I guess you can add stuff in there as well. I'm just gonna quickly make a master material. It's obviously, it's gonna be a lot more complicated when a real lead artist does it, but just to show the concept. All right, so I'm gonna make that, maybe some interesting color in there. Just gonna set that to one. Leave those as zero. Keep forgetting to hit apply. It's just taking a while. All right, and I start converting things to parameters. I'm just going to call this base color. So right click, convert to parameter. Uh, let's call that bloom. And you'll see in a while why I'm doing this. It's a specular and roughness, I guess. All right, so this is now a master material and this is the only one and only shader, theoretically, if, you, if you've done it right you should only have um, maybe one or three or a couple of master materials and everything else would be a material instance and any other shader would feed off this master material. So a tech artist usually takes over from here and then adds more complicated shaders, which is let's pretend I'm now a tech artist and I'm just gonna create a material instance. So I've basically made a very flat master material now I want to create a material instance that glows. A glow, a glow. A glow. yeah. So I'm gonna change the bloom to maybe 10. Yep, and immediately you could see that it glows. Just gonna drag that off there. Should have something that glows. Maybe it's a little bit too blah. Let's make it more glowy. All right, so just a example pipeline. 
So, yeah, so we, I guess we can make it um, a bit more glowy, but I mean, a bit more emissive. But yeah, so that's uh, a pretty basic pipeline of the beginning of, uh, well, most CUE projects and most VR projects. So you have now got to start off what, where the artists would start working and where um, the developers can start working. So we're going to go back to be a, uh, becoming a developer. And one thing I'm going to skip for this part, at least for this session, would be the actual uh, levels because we could normally you'd also want, I've made it pretty basic here, you'd probably want streaming levels in here at the very beginning so multiple people can start working on the same project at the same time. But for this session, we'll keep it simple and we'll have this, uh, uh, we'll just keep it to this one level. And we're not going to use any streaming levels. All right. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast, too slow? Everything's all good? All right. Awesome. All right, so now let's add some movement mechanics. So I promised you that we are going to do some movement mechanics. So it's pre the six degrees of freedom is pretty basic, right? So you'd, um, what you'd want to do is that when I point this controller, press the trigger, I'd want to be able to move. And let's just add uh, something to it. Like if I press this trigger, it will be the acceleration. So once, while I'm pressing this, I'm reaching the maximum. So from zero to one. And then with our defined speed, as I'm pressing the trigger, we go faster, right? So that's how we're going to do this mechanic. So the math should be pretty simple. So uh, anyone can basically tell, tell us what they feel the math should be. So it should be pretty simple. So you'd want to have your current vector and then calculate somehow your direction where this thing is facing and then um, add the speed and the direction to it and then you'll get to the loca your target location. So I don't know if you have a board, but I guess. All right, so before I get there, so one of the things that's probably, um, do you have any questions so far? No? So probably one of the things that you'd be asking is like, hey, how the hell do I get um, input? Like, how do I read the actual input from the controller? So with Unreal, there's some several mappings available. So there's uh, some of the more classic diagrams here made by some people in the community. Um, so this is for the Vive. And since I'm using the Rift, I'm just going to quickly move to the Rift. And you could see that the, um, you have what we call the motion controller left and motion controller right triggers in there. I'm not sure if it shows here. It surely doesn't. So, so you have, that's a motion controller left um, trigger and the trigger axis goes from zero to one. So zero being nothing and then one being fully depressed. So we're gonna take advantage of that as our acceleration. So let's just open this up. If I can snap it in. All right, so one thing I like doing before um, what I normally do with um, event begin play is I start um, VR, like I enable HMD. So there's an old code enable HMD. But the, if you remember the project settings that we did earlier, so Unreal has changed the engine so that you just have a tick box at the beginning. So to ensure that you run the, um, the project in, in VR mode. So a lot of people who um, maybe participate in game jams find this out too late because everything works in the, um, when you start playing with the editor and then you, you know how game jams are, right? right? So crunch time, you're trying to release the darn thing, you package it and then you run it, it runs, it doesn't run in VR. So that used to be a classic problem. So Epic uh, added the, that tick box there. So, but you still have that. So I'm just going to note that. So in case you have um, cases where you want to enable and disable HMD, the uh, VR mode, that's how you do it. Siri, yep. and then if you use that mode, can you then disable it as yeah. well and just go back to playing the game like you did with traditional desktop games? I haven't. That's a very good question. I haven't actually tried it. Yeah. But it will be, yeah, it should be definitely possible. Like, so it does yeah. All 
All right, so we have that. Um, I'm not going to do that now. But one of the things with, um, with VR then is the floor level. So this is still something that you have to manually do. So with the Rift and the Vive, we have different floor levels. Uh, sorry, we have a single tracking origin is what it's called. So. There's a million things in here. So in most cases, unless you've um, started develop, you've um, gotten a lot of money and can afford a PS4 dev kit, you'd probably be stuck with uh, a Rift or a Vive, so you'd have a floor level. In any other case, if you have a PS4 dev kit, um, you'd have that into the eye level. Right. So, but in this case, we're only going to be using it for the Vive and the Rift. Just as a note. So if you've ever seen the VR template, you'll actually see that they have a switch node in there for the name of the HMD. So just like tagging that. So Rift and Vive support. All right. Okay, so let's get back to the actual input from the controllers. So everyone remembers what the uh, input is again? Feel free to, don't be shy. Motion controller, right? Yeah, so motion controller. And I'm left-handed, so I'm just gonna start with the left one. So I want a uh, motion controller event. There's also a value if you just want to read the trigger axis. Um, but in this case, I actually want to have the event with and then re returning the trigger axis. So this is going to be the basis of our input. And what I like doing, let's pretend that I haven't done this before. So I'll do a prototype. Um, I'll add a reroute node. I'll put a comment. And what do we need to figure out? Uh, I need to figure out where I'm supposed to go. So I'm going to be having to calculate my direction, right? And after calculating the direction, I'm um, gonna add another reroute node. And I'm gonna want to, I guess, move there, move to the location. So two simple steps, calculate the direction and move to the location. So now I've just broken apart um, that, yeah, not so big a problem into two simple things. All right, so how do we actually calculate the, the direction? So as we said, we, I wanted the motion controller. That will be my frame of reference, right? And I want to be able to know where this motion controller is. So with classic game programming, just gonna get the rotation of that and you'd want to get the, as I'm only wanting to ever move to where it's pointing, I want to get a forward vector out of that. And obviously like where the pawn is, I'd like to be able to know where I am. I'll just start off with get actor location. All righty, so we have a leave all the key pieces together. And what are we still missing? So we've got the different vectors, but we're probably missing the speed, yeah, how fast we can go max speed. So I'm just gonna create quickly a variable here. Uh, let's call it speed. Change that to a float, I compile it. Um, let's use 10, oh no, it's probably too fast. It's just five as a default value. And we already know this goes from zero to one, right? So we'll multiply the um, access value with the speed. And 
that should give us some forward movement. And from here, we'll multiply the forward vector with whatever comes up in here. And then we'll just simply do an addition in there. <coughs> if I can combine nodes. So basically what I've done is calculated the direction and I'm now starting to move to the location. So to move, there are several ways to do it. I like using the teleport one the teleport node, simply because it obeys physics and collisions. So if I was doing um, a more sophisticated game, I probably won't use a teleport node, probably use a move actor. So yeah, because if I want more control over the code, but for this demo, we're just gonna use a simple one just gonna start removing that and clean up a bit here. All right, so, and the rotation, we'd want to keep the whatever rotation the actor is in or whatever um, the player's rotation is, so. Do that. Try to tidy up a bit. I'm a bit OC with, um, with Blueprint stuff node. It's because I'm coming from a C++ background. I like to keep things neat, but all right. So we have um, the access value. Let's just double check things. So as, as I'm pressing the trigger, I'm getting a, an acceleration here from zero to one. And then I reach maximum speed, which is one. And then I multiply that with the forward vector of where the motion controller is and add that to the current location and then the, and then obviously just plug in the current actor rotation so we're not changing the rotation. So let's see how that goes. What's, what's yeah. your uh, speed value? Uh, the speed value, I've set up a default here of 5.0 okay. from here. So I've kind of cheated a bit but just uh, plugging in a magic number from there. All right, so you're, you're, it will then go from zero to maximum five as we're pressing the trigger theoretically. So now that we also have a frame of reference, I'm not sure you can see that, should be able to, as I press a trigger, I can speed up and slow down. I could point it back. I could just fly around. So this is one of the first things that I started developing in VR that I did was basically grab the mesh of uh, Star Trek spaceship Enterprise and started flying around it. So it's like a childhood dream. So it's one of the more fundamental mechanics that you could do easily within VR, so like relatively quickly. So we did that in probably like five to 10 minutes. All right, but obviously the, the session is not just because of that. So we want to be able to expand on that. All right. so. I'm working on a uh, development workflow here, right? So I've just done the left hand and I'm just, I want to do the same thing for the right hand. So the easiest way to do obviously is to just copy and paste. But this is a, at this point when I'm doing, when you're about to do a copy paste as a developer, it's time to refactor so that you can just reuse things. And I guess for our developers here, it's probably um, quite obvious. What you need to do is just simply create a function so I can just quickly create two functions here in Blueprint. Uh, let's say get direction. And then let's say move this actor. All right. Let's start off with, this is where you, if you have. Let's start off with get direction. Let's see how we um, broke this apart. So basically just all these nodes uh, from here. Yeah, this is very really good. So the input would be, um, we probably want an input of the speed. I know, let's just focus on the direction here. So we'd probably want an input of the reference. And that's pretty much it. 
for the get direction. So we'd like to create a direction reference. And I could go to a different class, but let's just go to a motion controller component so we're pretty sure that, because we're, at least in this experience, we're gonna be pretty sure it's gonna be a motion controller as our direction reference. And basically, all you need to do now is to grab that. And we're gonna have an output of a forward vector. So let's just call it direction, I guess. Make this easy. Which is a vector. And now we do that. We remove the motion controller from there. Plug that in. If it plugs in, add the direction. And we've just refactored that. So I can now remove that from here and just simply drag the get direction function that we had. We plug that in and I guess we need to grab this again. All right, so next we're gonna move all of this into move this actor. We'd probably, um, we will need the speed and the direction as an input. So let's do direction, speed, which is a float, and the acceleration as well, I guess. and just grab all that no those nodes in there. Refactor it here. So if I was prototyping, this is how I would normally go about prototyping it. Do that. Probably put the speed from there. And the direction vector. Well, let's make sure everything's, and we won't have any output. All right, so now we can just simply do this. Plug in the direction, we plug in the acceleration, and we plug in the speed. Let me just give this, since I was rushing that a bit, just give it a quick try, make sure everything still works, so everything's still working. Now it'll be relatively easy to do the same thing for the right controller. Let's just duplicate that and let's just change the outputs, the inputs, sorry, to the motion controller right. And now I should have something that works for both the left and right function. Both left and as well as the right, so it's all working and they can fight with each other. Okay, so um, one of the uh, things that actually um, you probably want to do um, move to C++ are things that happen every tick or every frame. So you'd um, want to move those things to C++. So let's move, um, in this case, just let's move this actor bit. This whole thing here, so pretty simple. A bit of math, and also I like putting things that are math related into C++ just because it's a lot readable, in my opinion. 
So one of the things that you can do is um, I probably want to be able to make a component that I can add to every different actor, to a lot of different actors that would want to be able to move. So because in this game we have um, the pawn moving and we have the boomerang moving. So I probably want to use the same thing without having to recode. So one way you could do that in Unreal is you basically add a component. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new C++ class. And there's several choices here. So you have what we call an actor component. An actor component is basically, it's attached to the actor and you won't be able to attach it to any other component. So if you wanted to be able to attach the specific component, um, you use a scene component. It's not really that much uh, difference except the actor component doesn't have the translate and scene component does. So in this case, I just want it attached to the, um, the actor itself. So I'll just use actor. And let's just call, call this VR movement. And that has a nice um, impact as well of converting our project to C++. So while that's good, it's gonna take a while for that thing to start converting stuff. So I'd like to go over some of the key things that I promised um, <coughs> with regards to performance. So obviously um, sacrosanct in, in VR, it's probably you've heard it a lot, is 90 frames per second. So especially if you're gonna be trying to publish in the different stores, so with the Oculus, there's um, when we try to develop things that are gonna be published in the store, we always look at Oculus, simply because they're usually the lowest common denominator. They're very, very strict. And yeah, um, one of the projects we were working on is, was, was a big project, and we had, what was it? GTX 970 was the, was the minimum, and then, that, then a couple of months into the project, they changed it to 960. I believe, so then our tech artists went ballistic because it's like really difficult um, to get that published with the amount of artwork uh, we've done. So, but Epic helped us um, through that cycle, which is very good with, um, with Epic if you have a part either a partnership or a license with them. They would actually have like their expert, um, the actual people who develop the engine help you in several things to keep things performant, especially in VR. So. The thing, the key stuff in here, if I can show it, is 90 frames per second. You do have ASW, which allows you 45 frames um, per second, but you probably don't want that any, um, in any, for any long period of time, because then you'll give the, you'll almost certainly give a lot of people motion sickness. So, Although that is um, allowed in the Oculus Store if you're using a GTX 960, which is a minimum spec. Um, the, for the code side, which is where, where I focus on mainly, you have three milliseconds. So what I always um, like telling my developers is that uh, us developers is basically to allow people, uh, to allow the artists to do their great job. Because a lot of the stuff that we developers do is basically facilitate the eye candy, and that's where the money comes in because when people see cool stuff, they pay for it. So the, the art of the developer is to make sure that we get out, we make sure that they have enough leeway or a lot of free room to maneuver. And we have a maximum of three milliseconds. So for a lot, um, for if I'm leading a team, I usually try to make that two milliseconds um, every frame. Um, one of the key rules as well that the Epic guys have learned during um, creation of the Robo Recall, it's always harder well, from their experiences to scale down than up in terms of scene design. So you'd probably want to start with basic scene and then just move up from there and keep adding stuff and not dump a lot of things in there and then try to uh, move it down, at least from their experience. It, um, you'd want to scale um, things up than down. So especially with, uh, with VR. And you're, um, one of the key things that, I guess if you've gone through a lot of VR titles and made a lot of uh, development in that cycle, is very, be very pragmatic. Um, as a developer, I can sometimes be over, 
um, zealous with the performance. But the key thing is you should always, if it works, it works, leave it alone. When you have a problem, then deal with it then. Um, obviously, you, you try to be careful to make things performant, but yeah, but be always pragmatic. So if you're hitting the frame rates, leave it be. Um, yeah, and as mentioned, additive approach, start with base, you keep adding to it, um, and then keep making it look good from there. Um, and this is sometimes a, a struggle I find with tech artists, is they tend to like to put everything in, and then they complain that it's not working, and then it's somehow it's a developer who has to actually make it work, but it doesn't work that way. So some of the projects I work with, we have to go through the shaders and actually try to scale things down. But yeah, it's really difficult to, once you see it, it's very difficult to take it away from them. So always try to tell them, like, move it up. Um, the maximum 500 to 1,000 draw calls, some, some wisdom from um, Robo Recall as well. Um, so drop frames that cost this comfort are not worth better quality graphics. So we've gone through um, some of our, the projects I've worked with, we, um, we hire like QA, um, QA people and we have focus groups come in, like different types of people and it's definitely not worth like making them sick. And especially if you're very passionate with VR as we were, as we were, as we are, um, it's very disappointing to see someone get turned off VR because they had a really bad experience from your game. So it's not really worth it, um, uh, especially with the new industry. So keep that in mind when you're um, putting people on their headsets. Um, just to make things look good for most people, but yeah, you probably, we want the market, we want to increase our market. Okay, so maximum of one to two million tries or vertices. And again, don't rely on ASW. And yeah, use LODs, calling, and batching. Um, so a lot of them are art, which is not a focus of here, but for code, three milliseconds is our top goal. And I would normally say two. And for Vov said, you know, it's 11 milliseconds, but Vov always says 10 milliseconds, simply because if you try to hit 11, you'll always hit 11 and more. So always try to hit 10 in terms of the, for the GPU side, sorry, <laughs> need to be more clear. So GPU and then CPU is the three milliseconds. All right, so that's saying that. All right, cool. So now we're in the fun stuff. Can that? That readable? Probably not. All right. All right. So we're now in the C++. C++ so I've just created a component, um, basically from the editor. So you could see it's like really easy. And what I normally like doing is um, asking the question. And this actually came up when um, from my plugin um, when it first got reviewed by Epic. Is like hey, you've got a lot of ticks here when you're not doing anything on it. So to keep, um, keep it performant, you can remove them. So by default, they're there. So I would remove all of those. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah especially critical with, with Blueprint. So anything that's in, in tech, yeah. So, and everything in tech, usually in Blueprint, I would always say, put it in C++, shouldn't be there. Um, and normally, you know, all those grayed out boxes, one of the things sometimes do is just wipe them all out and then just use the stuff that I need when I need it. All right, so we've got that. Um, let's see. All right, for this one, we just want to create a function that actually moves the actor. So, I'd want to be able to get the actor where this component is attached to in the hierarchy, right? So maybe I'll just use that as private. Oh, what's going on? Okay. All right, so we know it's gonna be an actor. Let's just call it owner. Some fancy naming there, All right? And that's going to be where we're going to keep um, the 
actor where the component is attached to. Just gonna add null pointer. We're gonna do a, we just want a u function in here. It's an unreal function, so I'm gonna use a u function macro to expose it to blueprints. Uh, and then just say blueprint callable. That's it. And so for this function, there's no return value. And we just say, what do we call it again? Move this actor. We had uh, an input of a f vector, which is the direction. And I think we have float, which is the speed, and a float, which is acceleration. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. And let's just do a quick build. <laughs> this build should fail because we haven't implemented it, but. I'm just trying to kickstart um, the C++ parsing because with a component, this has this weird thing. Um, but while that's happening, it might take a while. Let's just go back to the performance settings. Oh, we've actually covered all of it. So I talked too much in there. So let's just have a look at, nope. All right, so in times like this, so you go for a coffee if you're a developer and chat and say, this is the best excuse for developers. Like, oh, it's building. And we're just walking around. But let's make our time a little bit more productive. And let's start putting some assets in. Let's say the art team has started putting some assets in. So I'm going to do new folder in here. Uh, let's just add some assets. I'm going to import. Let's add this surfboard. All right, so the art team has all right, committed this um, assets here. I'm not going to add them all. I'm just going to start with the surfboard. So we're going to do this. And what I like doing, especially if you're a developer, you don't care what the asset is. So sometimes I just quickly look, all right, I like you take that, combine meshes, if I want it to be a single mesh or if it's a skeletal mesh. I don't like importing materials and textures. Let me just do that. Have something clean. Obviously, the art team would have, would, would do the final touches on it, but just to get the mesh there. I just press Control Shift S just to save everything. So now we have the surfboard. And if I go back to the pawn, all right. Let's go to the viewport to see how our pawn looks like. All right, so in a game, I'd like to be able to move, and I'd like to have uh, a surfboard, which is what I'm using. Um, back in the good old days, some of the key rules in creating movement mechanics is to have a frame of reference in your camera. This um, helps prevent uh, motion sickness. So one of the things, so what, what the surfboard here is doing is kind of also give, um, especially, newbie users in VR, a frame of reference in their eyes, especially with this type of movement mechanic, which is free roaming, um, so that they don't get um, sim sick. All right. So what that does is I'd like to be able to move, but not move the surfboard when I do this or up or down. And I still want to have a little bit of a natural movement when I do this. I don't do, I can't surf, but I can imagine how it is. So if you do this, I'd like to have the, the surfboard move a little bit naturally like this and tilt. So um, if you've done game development in Unreal before, um, even outside um, VR development, one of the nice cool things, cool components you have is called the spring arm, which I would be using here. I'll attach it to the camera and that would add that natural movement of thing. It wasn't meant for this, but it works well. And I'm gonna limit the pitch. I'm gonna allow it the yaw and the roll to happen. And then we can attach. I'm gonna be just lazy here. And just do a 
that. It should attach the static mesh component in there. All right, I'm just gonna um, eyeball this a little bit. Obviously, in a, in a real VR experience, you'd have either a calibration mode or from the engine, maybe try to figure out the height of the user from the floor, but here I'm just gonna do a bit of eyeballing. Then just go. And that should be pretty much it. So the thing finished giving us an error, that's fine. And that should be it, but maybe just show this a little bit. So now we have a surfboard that should move a little bit naturally if you do this and this, right? So, yeah, so it's a bit difficult to, sh um, to see from just watching it, but the, there's a huge difference when you have that tilt in there. And in a lot of VR development, it's all about the feel inside the headset. So um, one of the things that um, for the company I work for now, um, I helped start the, um, the VR development team is I ensured that all of my devs would have a rift because it's, you can't really develop without a headset in VR. You could always see things, but it's really different. It's mostly about the feel mostly about a lot of it, a lot on the scale, especially for artists. So, all right, so let's go back to um, the C++ side and let's do, and I'll just, if it allows me, I'm gonna create an implementation. I'm using Visual Assist, which is really um, nice. It's quite fast. Um, for C++, in, especially with Unreal, and once you become more advanced when you're actually editing the engine itself, um, it's really a lot better than any, well, there's three sharper, but, it, but um, Visual Assist, even the Epic guys actually use um, Visual Assist because it just compiles a lot faster in this, sorry? Yes, yeah, so, yeah. All right, so we have um, move this actor so at begin play, I'd probably want to get the owner, right? So I get owner, and we have owner. So I have a lot of my creative naming coming up in here. And moving this actor is now the math, right? So we have teleport. Let's see, after plugging it, doesn't help. Let's keep that as is. Uh, so we'll have the direction. We'll add it to the, we'll have it to, sorry, that's why. Being silly. So we'd want the owner and get actor location and we'd add the we'll add the, the to the actor location we'll add the direction multiplied by the speed times acceleration, similar to the one we did in Blueprint, all right? And we'd have the get actor rotation. So I keep forgetting the component. Yes, exactly, yeah, so, um, I, yeah, in traditional gaming, you'd like to, you'd be, I guess most tutorials you'd see um, the delta, yep. but I tend not to use it because, yeah, you'd try to hit 90 anyway. So you'd always try to hit a consistent frame rate. And anyways, the, even ASW would try to, the engine would, if you hit ASW, the, it will always try to keep you at a constant frame rate. So for VR, it doesn't matter 
as much. So as you could see here, this annoying red squiggles in there, right? So and it'll give you this weird pointer to incomplete class is not allowed. Um, I just don't have the internet here at the moment. But um, that usually indicates that you've forgotten an include. And just because I know where it is. So it's because the owner is an, um, an actor and we need to include that header file. So it's in game framework actor H. All right, and that should get rid of that thing. And we should be able to build that. Now with um, one of the still not quite nice things with, um, with Unreal with C++ is if you do an actor component, you have to restart the editor. With actors, you can do, uh, it still does the hot, hot reloading. So it's just gonna do that. This shouldn't take too long. All right. So after that's done, sorry, boards and boomerangs. One A. It's going to restart that. So, with um, if you're developing a plugin as well for Unreal, it's still an annoying part is when you recompile or add things to your plugin, you still have to restart the editor. So, sometimes I would do like a host project and do all the coding as actors and then just move the code across as a plugin. So we have that. Now if we go back to VR and then VR pawn. We go to the event graph. Let's change this bit. This guy here on the left to a inside the VR movement. All right, so you could see that this is a C++ um, component that we've just made. I guess I should show that, eh? You could see on the C++ side, we have the VR movement. And the function we did is we named it the same thing, which is move this actor. Gonna add that in. And we're gonna have a speed. and then the acceleration in there, and the direction. Let's just have a quick go. Yep, so this one is now running in pure C, in, in C++, and this one is running in blueprints on the right side. Now to, this is about, once we start putting assets in, this is right about the time if you, I will go to the console. You can't see it from here, let me just close it. Console and start doing stat unit. There's really not much interest in the scene at the moment to show it. And I'm hoping OBS is not gonna kill this frame rate. and show me really bad frame. So you should be able to see. It's actually not coming out for some reason. Yeah, no, the, the problem is I can't. Put your headset on, we'll see it. Yeah, it's close to the middle. No, it should detect my head already, this one. But my, Can you click? Yeah, click here. Yeah, so just, maybe it's just because it's black. You should still get a better better because it's almost straight. Uh, 
Yeah, so, all right. So I'll add that in once we get more stuff in here when I have more lighting, so you could actually see. But anyway, so this is what the artists um, usually use just to look at into the scene and see if there's any problems in there from the GPU side. From the CPU side, which is what I want to actually show. And let's see if it, this is gonna be a challenge here. Um, I'm gonna start profiling both the C++ and the Blueprint. So I'm gonna do start, start file. From there. So I'm gonna use the left controller, then the right. Yeah, move it back, yeah, right. Let's get a couple of frames in there. So, then we should be able to go to window, developer tools, session front end, go to profiler, and be able to load the, oh, I haven't, did I say start file? Yeah. Yeah. So we should be able to load that one now and let's just wait for it to load up all right and so obviously you, you can read this but what i like doing at least when i'm profiling this so you could see if i do this move this actor in the filter it here i could see um the blueprint version that i just made and the c++ version And yeah, so at the moment you could see it's nice to look at the averages and the maxes from here. So in some, if we played around with it a bit, we should get a bit more than this, but even with that simple code, we're getting a, uh, a much better performance from the C++ side from the VR movement component versus the blueprint from here if you look at the averages alone. So in some profiling stuff, you would normally get like around 10 to 30% improvement, even with basic math. So you could imagine that for this movement um, component alone, if you attach it to multiple different actors in the scene, how much savings that would be, especially if you're thinking about the three millisecond rule for developers, right? Questions so far? What about yeah. the Blueprint? Yeah, so with nativizing Blueprint, that actually works in most cases. Um, the problem with um, nativ nativization, at least from a developer perspective, How is that word? nativization. Okay. Am I pronouncing it right? Nativization. Like like yeah. 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 It turns Blueprint into C++ on compiled. Yeah, so everything is an inline function which sometimes is, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty good and pretty solid now after Robo Recall. But um, the improvement with a, with a real developer is still a lot better, I would say, especially if you've done careful thought with your architecture. But if you're not very comfortable yet with, um, with C++, that's probably a good way to go just to improve your, your performance. Um, yeah, so if you're a tech artist, you can use that devisation. It's pretty solid, it's a lot solid now. There will be cases, especially with complex blueprints, that that won't work, won't compile. What I would suggest, um, if you're doing nativization, do consistent, uh, do a lot of frequent test builds of your project, just to make sure it actually runs on a published game, not just on the editor, so. Uh, 
also link all with uh, all the specific new properties we have to prepare. Uh, they play a very significant role in serving the uh, fertilizer market in Greece and other countries as well. So we, yeah. we can use the new yeah, the to, to influence that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. you see stuff like steak and so like really good wine. Yeah. But yeah. So um, yeah. 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 I really wouldn't uh, uh, suggest that, um, especially if you've ever seen the native device code. It's actually not readable, at least for me unless you're like maybe a really, really good developer, even if you're a really good developer, just trying to maintain that code is probably not. I would just rewrite it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. But yeah, but in a pinch, if you're a tech artist, that's their savior, I would say. All right. Um, all right, so where did we leave off? All right, so we've got a VR movement. How about um, let's just simply attach this to a different actor, which is the boomerang, right? So, you've already seen the importing process. Assets and then um, boomerang. So I'm not, just gonna do that, import that. Alrighty, so I just hate those asterisks, so I immediately press Control Shift S just to save everything. This is my OC again. All right, so I'm just gonna convert this. So obviously there's a number of ways to do it, but I'm just doing it like a really basic way. So BP underscore blueprint, uh, BP underscore boomerang. So it's uh, placeable, so I'll put it under placeables. If you want to read up about this, just look at uh, Alar style guide. Alar? Alar, yeah, sorry, A-L-L-A-R, it's a name. Yeah. Alyar, how would you pronounce it? Alar, uh, Alar. is it? Alar. So f he used to do the, he used to do the reviews for the game jam entries, right? Doesn't yeah. do it anymore. Who does the, what's his name again? But anyways, um, all right, so another cool component that Unreal has is the rotating movement component. I used to actually implement this on my own until somebody tweeted it. I said, oh, it's there. Because <laughs> the engine is quite big, unless you know what you're looking for. So what I do is I just want that to keep rotating kind of like a boomerang. And one of the things, if you do it from the editor, which is why I wanted to show it that this way, and then create a static mesh actor out of it by creating edit blueprint, is it won't move like this, although I added the rotating movement. And the reason for that is, by default, that is set to static. So now it should just rotate. All right, and that's just a quick way for me to test as well that should be moving. All right, so let's go back to the PowerPoint slides. 
So if we go back here, you could see what we want for this um, boomerang is to respond to the thumbstick. So I press up and down like this, left and right, it should move with it. So it's relatively simple. The problem is Unreal uh, obviously uses its own coordinate system. And there's a, and the different controller manufacturers have their own coordinate systems and the way they interpret the thumbstick as well from here. You can see which is one, negative one and one, which is X and which is Y. And I'm just, I just created this quick graphic here for both the Vive, the Oculus, and Unreal. So you could see that this is Y, up is Y, negative Y, negative X, positive X. For the ref, which is what we're using, this part is negative Y, this is positive Y, positive X, negative X. And in Unreal, it's, yeah, it's not the best, but it's positive X in here, negative X in here, positive Y in here, negative Y in here. That means we have to reverse the X and the Y, right? If you look at it here, if you're gonna translate which is which, and with the Y, since it's opposite, we'd have to negate it to convert it from negative to positive or positive to negative. So it's sometimes handy to have something like this just to see. So it will be good if you like have a printout and then when you're doing a game that you want to support different hardware, just to have that as a handy reference, especially if you want this kind of movement mechanic. The mechanic itself now is like gonna be really simple because we've already done the hard work. So that's so what Alex was mentioning earlier um, about this node. So I tend to, oops, remove stuff that I don't need as well. Things clean and performant. So to get an actor to accept input, you'd want to enable input on it. So there. And we're doing a single player game, so it doesn't really matter for this case. Get player controller zero, put that in, and that's it. So we're basically just enable. So this um, actor will now accept input. And then the thumbstick, if we can find one, thumbstick axis, I guess. So we have thumbstick X for the left. I'm just gonna use the left one now. And then thumbstick Y. All right. And then we're just gonna reverse that from our VR movement mechanic. And we have moved this actor, right? So um, this event, by the way, when you see an axis value, that means um, it happens, um, it can happen per tick or per frame. So that's something that you need to be careful of. When I see that, I immediately say, all right, the function that comes after that has to go to C++ immediately. So, yeah, and that's why I'm using the C++ version here. And basically, we split this struct. I guess acceleration will keep it a constant one. I'm just gonna cheat here and put a movement there, maybe five as well. All right, so X goes to Y and Y goes to X, right? Based on that diagram I just showed you. But Y needs to be flipped. So just gonna do a simple negation here. Negate that to negative one, right? So we have times negative one. All right. And we're not gonna do anything with the Z, which is the height for now. So, if we've done it correctly, we should be able to, yeah, this is a bit difficult to demo, like, unless you're using it, so we should be able to move like this. I could have put that bit of code into the pond itself. So a lot of people nowadays, I don't like this movement mechanic where 
I do this and then I move around in 360. But it seems to be quite popular nowadays. So, but yeah, so that's why I'm adding it to an, a different actor. So now I can control that. And similarly, I could fly while I'm controlling the boomerang if I figure out what it is. Yeah. And that just made our lives a lot simpler. And also a lot of these things can then be done by a level designer. All right, any questions so far before I move on? No, we're almost there. So, okay, so we've basic, what we've basically done is we've created something from scratch from Blueprint Yes, yeah, so um, not sure if I got the question correctly, but um, you could use any of these inputs. You could use um, the thumbstick, you could use the triggers to do the movement and just change the, uh, let me just open that up. Like from here, just change the input nodes um, to whichever you want. And there's heaps of them, like if I do motion controller, all of these things are available in there. There is some, um, this should work with, in most cases, um, with, with Oculus Rift and the Vive um, for the Oculus Store. Ah, uh, sorry, with obviously Oculus for the Oculus Store. Um, Steam is coming up with a new input system um, which makes it a little bit complicated, but um, Epic is trying to add it into the same way like this one. But I guess um, I should talk about it because it's going to come up in the next release of the engine. But yeah, it's just, um, it defaults to something, you know, actions, and then you have to set, and then you have to kind of do things manually, pin the, uh, pin the inputs. But for now, in the current land, in current VR land, current iteration of the engine, it's as simple as this until the Steam, um, well, until the Steam VR input system comes up in public. Yep. It's under beta at the moment, but yeah. So, all right, did I answer that question? Yeah, yep, okay. Yeah. Um, where was I? All right, so we have, so we've, and then we decided to move, um, completely create a, oh no, we haven't actually. So we've, and then we've reused that C++ code onto a different actor. So now let's look at um, this other, so we've got most of the pieces of the mechanics, right? So let me just see, except the third one. So we've got the 360 here. We've obviously got this. Uh, we haven't even done this. It's quite simple. But this one. So we have obstacles and we want them to be floating up and down like this. So we want smooth movement for this up and down. So if now, since you're seasoned developers now, C++ developers, um, the key decision there, since obviously you have an event tick and all it's doing is bobbing up and down, this is something that you'd immediately want to do from C++. So now, mechanic itself is quite simple, just moving up and down. So we'll just, we don't have to even prototype it, I hope. And we'll just immediately create the C++ class. All right, so we'll create an actor. So we created one from Blueprints, right? So now I'm gonna create an actor straight from to C++. So we call this, bobbing actor, and we're just gonna give it that bobbing motion up and down. Create that class, and since it's just a basic actor, we should be able to do the hot compile. I don't need to restart the editor. And there it comes up. All right, so times like this, Okay. 
All right, so now we have a bobbing actor, and this time I actually want the tick, so we're gonna leave that alone in there. Okay, so we're just gonna leave those alone. Um, what do we need for um, a bobbing actor? So we need how fast, it go, whether it's going up or down, I guess. So let me just do the macro quickly. So you, um, your property is what you're looking for, and I want to be able to read and write in Blueprint. And I want it to be editable anywhere. Anywhere, if I can type it in, nope. It's not gonna help me. And category, I like putting things PR. Alrighty, so we have Blueprint read write, so you could see that's that for us because it's already an actor. Um, what did we say, Boolean? And let's just give it, moves up at the beginning. Um, then once I've typed that all down and a bit lazy, just copy paste that. Um, we'll need how fast it goes, so uh, yeah, we call it step. And I know, start with one, all right? And what else do we do? We'd want the max things that we go. For this one, let's keep it simple. It's the same max and min. So we'll keep it as float min max z. Uh, let's say 50. And so those are the th stuff we need. Um, we'll then need the function itself. And the reason I'm exposing the, the properties is that uh, sort of when I create a blueprint actor out of the C++ code, I can just simply, the level editor can simply edit it from his end without having to go to C++. So then I'm gonna do a U function again. Uh, Blueprint callable, All right? And that's it. And yeah, I guess it doesn't return anything. And some creative naming here. So I'm just gonna call it move this actor. Actually, you know what? We don't even need a function here because we'd want the bobbing actor to keep moving on its own, so I'll just put it on event tick, keep it simple. And we probably want to keep track every frame where we're at at any given time, which um, current Z and whether we're moving forward or backwards, right? So I'm just gonna do private. I hope I'm not boring a lot of people now. It's all coding. Um, all right, so let's do float current Z and float current step. All right, okay, so I'm just gonna quickly do this. Um, so for current step, we'll, let's check if we are moving up. All right, so if we're moving up, that means it's positive. Um, so our current step should be just simply equal to the step that the level designer wants. Otherwise, we have current step equals to the step divided by negative 1.f. All right, so now we have a step that either goes up or down and then we'll probably want to update the current Z, right? So the current Z would be what it is now plus the current step, whatever that is at that frame. Okay, oops. Yep. All right, and then I want to be able to flip-flop the boolean of moving up or down depending if we've reached the max or exceeded the max or 
um, exceeded the min, min, all right? So if we're moving up and the current z is greater than the min max, right? Then we'd want it to move down. So b is moving up equals to false, right? Else if we, let's just do, use the style guide from epic. So if b, um, if it's not moving up and the current z is less than the min max z times negative one, then we'd want to flip it, I guess. So a bit late, so I hope I'm not mocking this up, but yeah. Alrighty, so that takes care of that. And now let's actually move the darn thing. <laughs> so teleport to, uh, where do we want to teleport it to? So the um, current location. Their location plus the vector, whether we're not doing an up or down, so because we want to keep track of the. So we're doing just on the z axis, right? So it's zero point f and the whatever the current step is. Okay. Um, and I'd like to keep the actor rotation. And that should be it. Just quickly eyeball that. So pretty simple stuff. I shouldn't say simple if this doesn't work. Yeah. So it's just simply compile that. So hot reloading. So I can compile from here or from the editor in this case. Just, but I prefer doing it in Visual Studio. I immediately want to see stuff from here. So yeah, so grab another coffee, talk to your boss and say, yeah, I'm compiling. I'm doing productive stuff, all right? Go to Reddit or somewhere. Okay, so let's just have a, so this is what normally like um, a lot of the VR developers would do is just create a lot of this stuff and then allow the level designers to use this stuff uh, in Blueprint. So I'm just gonna create a Blueprint based on bobbing actor and put that as a placeable, right? So I'm gonna do, and I know I'm gonna make a floating stone. And if we did this thing right, if I do a simulate here, it should bob up and down. It's bobbing up and down, like that. All right, so we've done some pretty, all of the core mechanics now. So what we have is pretty much dev art stuff. Let's add a bit of a um, thing here. Um, let's, sorry, let's import an, let's import the rock shard here. Okay. And we want it to be able to be um, split when hit by the boomerang. So you make it uh, destructible. So with the new version of the engine, it's actually a plugin now. So we're gonna do, what was it called? Apex, I think. Yes, yeah, the Apex, all right, it's a built-in one. Destructible, just enable it, and fortunately we have to restart. That shouldn't take too long to restart. Yep, so it should just restart that. No. And what that gives me now is the ability to create a destructible mesh. So if I right click a static mesh, I could just right click on it, create destructible mesh. 
And I should be able to, so from this simple mesh, I should be able to fracture it, right? Just see how it explodes like that. So now we have something that will explode like that when hit. So if I do, so now we're seeing a little bit of eye candy. It's not really much. So if I do edit DP floating stone and open full blueprint editor, and I guess we do that. See that in if you do our thing right should just move towards it, is it? What is it doing? <laughs> ah, all right. So if you see that happening, which is sometimes good when you have make mistakes or forget things in a demo. Right. Um, that means if you look at back to the because there's a number of ways to do it to make it more realistic, obviously, um, with code. Um, but a really quick one if you're making a game is just enable the impact damage so that it will actually be destroyed when you see it. So yeah, so pretty s simple, but when you're in VR, it's pretty cool, especially if you hit that with your surfboard, which I've done quite a bit trying to um, prepare for this session, but yeah. So then you should have, where are we? DP floating stone. Let's have a look, it's movable. All right, and at this stage, you'd, um, let's put some eye candy in it. So at this stage, we've got all of the mechanics right. So Developer's job is done. Level designers come in, or they should have been coming in earlier, and start putting stuff in. So let's just make the, um, so feel free to ask questions, because at this stage, we're just going to mostly try to spice up the scene. So, um, but there could be some things here that you haven't um, seen before. So if you go to this show engine content, it's quite a number of content there, even if you don't have the starter content pack, which I really don't like adding um, in projects because it's just a lot of um, extra stuff there. And if you do sky, see here, a pinch, oops, sorry. Um, so this is a static mesh. What I'd like to do is it's actually not a placeable, but I just copy that there because I want to make modifications. And there's a procedural um, nighttime sky somewhere. Yep. So there's a material here called procedural sky. I'll put that in there and then copy here not move because it's our engine content. And then now I can safely cop, um, make edits to it. So I'll put that in. You immediately see some weird stuff in there. So, which is also a performance thing, is I probably don't want any shadows in there anyway. So shadows also obviously, especially if it's a dynamic object, can take a lot of performance stuff. All right, so. And then if we put the material that we just stole from Epic and just plug it in there, should have a starry sky. Now we probably don't even need the directional light, but let's just keep it maybe that. No, so too bright. Point one, and still too bright for me. 
it's, okay. it's a bit difficult when you have one screen. Just keep everything black here. It's now coming up. Something in there. And the stars, I'll keep it as is. You can play around with the sky brightness. Probably not what we want. With the star tiling. There. I'd like to remove the directional light, but the problem is we can't, might not be able to see can controllers. Just to keep it safe. Okay, we just um, keep it for this one because I have uh, another step <laughs> on top of this. I'm leading to, towards another thing. Sorry. So, um, what is that casting a shadow? All right, let's just remove that for now. It's annoying me. Um, all right, so this is kind of like the environment that I actually want to get to. It's just pure black with just a star. And one of the other mechanics that we kind of just breeze through is maybe I should do it now. Is just do a simple portal from here. And this portal, basically if I go back here, Oh, no, sorry. Um, I want to add a sphere collision, but it doesn't make sense at the moment. So let's get one of the assets from the art team and use their vortex just to make it look nicer. If I go to BP portal. And I want to change that static mesh to the one we just had. And I'll just remove that show engine content. It's gonna have the vortex in there. All right, so probably something that I'd want. I don't still have the right shaders, but we just add a sphere component here. Sorry, sphere collision going to quickly rough that up just so I can show the code. So, and this leads to a more complex mechanic, which is a teleport, which, we, um, which is outside the scope of this one. But I just want to quickly show, and for the sphere, I probably only want the pawn to overlap. So if we overlap with the pawn, um, I always prefer having the collisions. Uh, with VR, I tend to like creating sphere collisions or capsule colli collisions instead of box because they're a lot more mathematically um, more efficient, even though Unreal does a really good um, collision with um, meshes. You can even do complex collisions, but I feel they're just way too expensive for VR. Um, so with that, um, one of the things is if you're moving an actor from one point to another, if it's a huge amount of distance in VR, one of the things um, that a lot of research have found out is you'd like to do a fade in, fade out effect. And luckily, you can do this in C++ or in Blueprint, but luckily in Unreal, this is um, really easy to do. So if you do that, you can do a Fade, start camera fade. You could actually just fade the camera out to one fade to black. And then you could do, um, this is where it would have been nice to do a streaming level because this is where I would start streaming the level but not show it and then, and then do a fade in and then show the, show the actual um, level. But it's just, that could be for another Session. So we'll just do, I even forgot the ah, start level. 
how to do a basic level now. Open level, I think. Yeah, open level. So, and we want to do an end map. Yeah. And all that does is it moves us to the end map if the um, pawn actually hits that sphere collision in the center. All right, and I think we pretty much got to the, I'm just mindful of the time, so I'm just gonna quickly rough this up. All right, so we've got all of the key mechanics. Level designers comes in now, and I'm gonna cheat a little bit now. Is not really cheat, like in a game environment, this is where all, for me, like it becomes really magical, because once the artists start putting their stuff in, it looks starts looking really cool. So I'm gonna, grab some epic assets. So I've pre-selected some epic assets and, and kind of modified it a bit. And I'm gonna put it into the project. So this could represent a team. And that's why we actually put this kind of a structure. So the name, so at least you know which one comes from where. So this one is pretty clean. I'm only using the ones I'm actually um, using, so I'm not actually dumping the whole Paragon assets in there, or the whole um, Infinity Blade um, assets in there. I've just pre-selected some stuff. And the way I did that, and I found like the easiest way, because Unreal doesn't have a built-in way of doing it, is if you do a, a mock-up level, put all of your assets in, use all the materials you want, and put it in that level, then open up your real project, do a migrate, migrate the actual map, it will just migrate the stuff that it actually uses on that level. So that's one quick way of cleaning things up. So if you have these two projects and hopefully in some future iteration of the engine that should, we sh there should be something built in because if you start building things with all of these things, it'll be, it's a nightmare to build all of those shaders in. Um, and then you should instantly see a lot of those stuff in there. So for, let me just see what we've got here. Where's the boomerang? So for the boomerang, remove you. Got the material for the boomerang. And it's gonna start building shaders for the floating stone. I probably want to do this from here. I'm gonna choose one material there. For a surfboard, let's make the portal. So I think that's the coolest one for the portal once it builds. So I'm, I have a laptop with a 1080 on it, but still not enough for even basic stuff. Once the shade is built in, I can see a little bit better. <laughs> and I just want to scale that up, I guess, to 10. Really interesting. And once the shade is built, we should see a little bit more interesting stuff. So with the pawn, obviously you could do this as well directly from the static mesh itself. Epic assets. Where are you, surfboardy? I could also do it from here, but it's pretty lazy. I wish I could see it. All right, so it's just gonna pile shaders for now. And this is also, um, if you like learning stuff, right? So it's sometimes nice to look at how Epic does their shaders. Just for me, sometimes not as clean as it should be. You could also see that they're human too. They make mistakes. There's some notes there. Sometimes when you look at it, what the hell? Yeah. Or at least you could see that sometimes in Robo Recall, I think there's quite a bit of it. You could see some errant notes there and you could see where a developer or 
a tech artist probably under pressure to publish stuff. I've seen some stuff on the engine itself as well before. I think um, one of them was before, I was trying to change the IPD uh, for the headset and I did the code lazily, <laughs> trusted Epic. And whatever we did was it wasn't working. I said, uh, because for me, my site is pretty good, but when I have the um, project manager test it and saying, no, it's no good, it's not really changing anything. I said, no, of course it's changing something because the code is always right, right? And then ultimately I had to check with two other people and they said, no, it's not working. <laughs> then that's, yeah. Not being lazy, I actually looked at the code and somebody in Epic hard-coded the IPD onto the function instead of actually looking at the API and returning the IPD. But so that was funny, I reported it. And they never replied, but it got changed in the next iteration. <laughs> so, or maybe somebody got fired, I don't know. But, but yeah, but those are one of the things, right? Because as a developer, sometimes you trust the code too much, especially when it comes from Epic. So yeah, so you start seeing some visual interest and you could obviously with Unreal just create like really quickly mock up these levels like this. All right, so. and they should just bob up and down like in our demo. So immediately, um, just by putting um, you know, the, the eye candy in, it starts actually looking quite good. And the only other thing that I did, which I'm not maybe not gonna put too much time on now, with the floating stone thing is, remember the variables that I painstakingly typed in, which I would not have done? So if you do a C++, right? If you click on here and show inherited variables, so I like in the construction script, you should be able to see those properties come up from the blueprint side and then I'd randomize this. So it's very easy, so you just drag and drop. If I set this, I'll just do one here, do this. I'll just do a lazy random bool, done, step, set, step. It's not really ran completely random, but in a pinch, that should be random float in range, and then you could do some stuff in there. And then quickly with just that thing, because we're doing um, one BP and all of those are just copies, they'll just pop up and down like in the video. So yeah, so in, how did I do? Two hours? Two hours, we've been able to mock up like really quickly. Even, even, oh, sorry, <laughs> even when talking about it. It's like I'm cheating, eh? It's like it's not actually gonna move. So yeah. Yeah, so I see it moving. It's probably the scale is a bit big, oh, but it looks quite cool inside here. I don't know how it looks like in there, but inside the headset. Yeah, so a lot of it is feel. So where did my boomerang go? This is why I don't like my rift. Okay, can't even control my own game. So yeah. Ooh. Should probably have that a bit higher. I thought I could hit that. So I'm gonna use my surfboard, but I'm gonna give you guys homework, which is we've got <laughs> we've got a win condition here. I'm gonna post the code um, in GitHub. Um, I'm gonna just tidy it up and then add those randomization things um, just to randomize it and make it look pretty for you. But so we've done a win condition is. The homework is to do a loose condition, which is we have the boomerang, right? And we're able to destroy stuff um, with the boomerang. We're also able to destroy stuff using the using our surfboard here and fly around. But what would be nice is if we hit um, to have a bit of a penalty for the user. If you hit the surfboard, it slowly cracks up. And then once it's gone, then you can't move. You disable all of your movement. So from all of the key concepts we've done today, that should be pretty doable. Um, 
Yep, so just a little bit of a step up, but should still be fairly doable. And yeah, so now I'm just realizing I forgot something, which is good if we played this. Um, yeah, so that won't actually move because I forgot to add a collision inside the pond itself. <coughs> I'm going to use a capsule one. Oops, I just attach it to the camera. This um, eye bullet over here. Uh, skip that to 22 half height. Hmm. really rough work here but ship it <laughs> ship it yeah I'm sure the artists would love it pretty dev arty and it should be able to move to the next level so you haven't actually yeah yeah so it's pretty yeah so you see the you don't see it the fade to black and I would have done a fade in as well for for this, but I would have to use uh, streaming levels for it. So, but that's a whole different thing, and especially if you're working with multiple people at the same time in a in a project, that really comes in very handy. Then, and it's also quite nice to start seeing things pop up and start becoming beautiful as you're developing things. It's really quite cool when you have a team of um, people doing it, All right? So yeah, so that's uh, pretty much a basic game. So it's really that easy to create for uh, develop VR, um, develop for VR. And obviously I prepared for this session, although it took us like one or two hours to do it. But really, if I did this like really quickly without even talking, you would be able to pretty much hit the same um, time with a bit of debugging. And a lot of the mechanics aren't really that complicated, a lot of the math especially if you've done a bit of game programming before. So it's just translating that to VR and how, how it works in VR. So what have we done? We've set up a base VR project. We created a VR pawn. We added a couple of movement mechanics. So pretty simple stuff, six um, degrees of freedom with the flight, thumb sick, thumb, thumb pod driven. So you should be able to start playing around with that. And if you have really cool environments or cool scenes, like when I first started VR, I told you like I, grab the um, Star Trek Enterprise and just flew around it. It's just really a cool feeling once you start with it. And the headsets now are really quite cheap. I think they're like $300 now, is it? Yeah, so, and yeah. So hopefully with um, Oculus Connect 5 is coming up, they might be releasing a new headset. This might even come cheaper maybe, although that's a, maybe a different, Santa Cruz might be a bit of a different one. Uh, yeah, so, if this is something that you, just a bit of plugging for, for the company I work for, um, if this is something that you're interested in um, and you like to do it like full time, I do have an opening in my team. Um, I have a team at the moment of six, seven developers, um, juniors and seniors, and I need another senior. If you're a good, um, oh, I don't have to, um, <laughs> internet. Uh, if you're um, good in C++, good in rendering, good in the graphics pipeline, whether you don't have a game engine background or not, uh, we're more interested in looking at someone who can help us side of things and being able to level. So it's a skill that we, uh, we lack in, in our team at the moment. We're creating some XR um, stuff and yeah. And we, fair, uh, we pay a f uh, decent wage especially for this one. So I'll hopefully ask and post uh, a PDF file of this. And I'll also post it in the, in the GitHub page where I'll post the source code. Um, and then you can just have a quick click on that link at Seek, which is still there. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, they've, um, we, we're expanding um, also globally. So Real Series Games is expanding globally. So it's a really good time to, um, to start um, joining at least our our team and the VR development team. And I believe always, we're always looking for artists, especially animators, good animators. 
And yeah, so if you want to keep in touch with um, social media, I have the stuff there. My um, online moniker is uh, Grunberg. So I also publish a free plugin, uh, VR plugin, which has actually some of this movement mechanic, but a lot more generic and a little bit, has a little bit more to it than just this. It does have a teleport as well, um, an implement, a full C++ implementation of the teleport mechanic and a lot of other things, including what I'm particularly proud of is the gesture. Like you can record gestures and cast spells. Yeah. I use it for, uh, oh wait, sorry. Some things, I, yeah, but I, it's used in some titles where, yeah, where you have some gestures and you can cast spells and record gestures for it. All right, so I don't have any backup slides, but yeah, and that's it for me today. So I'll be able to pick up some stuff from there or a little bit, yeah. Any questions, final stuff? Otherwise, feed to death. Um, we're mostly in Unity. So at the moment, the uh, whole team is um, skilled in Unity, but we do have uh, enterprise license, especially for my team for Unreal. Um, I've started um, adding Unreal into our pipeline. So we're using um, both now. So we're gonna have, we're having projects both running in Unity and Unreal, and that's why I say it's exciting, especially for the developers, um, because you get to use both, especially if you're coming from Unity and then learning something new. So yeah, so you get to both. Yep. Cool. Cool. All right. Thank you.